All right, so we're here with the gentleman in Black Horse, John, Frank, Donnie. Hello, gentlemen. Nice to hey, see you. Hey, How you doing, brother? I'd say thanks for uh, coming out, but we're in your house, so thank you for having us. Yeah, I don't know whose house this is. Uh, I don't either. Oh, hi, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually squatting it. Who <laughs> <laughs> didn't somebody turn off the electricity? Oh, yeah, it's another house. So. All right, so. Uh, Legendary band. We're here at uh, Reckless Rock Radio. What we like to do is uh, we showcase a lot of the new bands, but we feel a lot of the veteran bands from Dallas Fort Worth are heavily uh, unappreciated and definitely misrepresented. Uh, so thank you for reuniting, for uh, lack of a better term. Believe me, it's our pleasure. <laughs> Very much. Very now, uh, just start right off the bat. How did this uh, rumor, uh, rumor reunion come together? Well, or is this a reunion? It, well, it, it's in in a sense it is because we all used to play together back mm -hmm. in the old day. Uh, Donnie was in the band, entered the band in the mid '80s at, when we went four piece, and Frank was one of the co-founders with me and Gary James, the late Gary James. Correct. Uh, and, and so basically we, when Frank left the band and the whole thing went south and then a lot of years went by, <laughs> uh, we relinked up, uh, a few started, years ago. Started right. jamming. Yeah. We yeah. just got in touch with each other on the phone and decided that we wanted to jam together. So, uh, we got a place out in the country and started jamming and decided that we wanted to uh, give it a go because, you know, yeah. he was right at home on guitar. He was right at home on bass. We all knew each other. Uh, it's and just a natural. That, it just like, fit natural. Yeah. It's like I told Donnie when he came in when we did the first jam. I said, dude, you feel like home, right. you know? The chemistry is just unbelievable, you know. And you guys go way back even before uh, the band started, right? You were friends? Well, we, well, Frank and I were, and Gary James, the late Gary James, our buddy, buddy and brother, he, us three got together in Mineral Wells. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary just came back from L.A. He was living in, in Hollywood for a lot of years playing in a band called The Visions. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, was that the same vision with uh, John Michael Soria yeah. or? Uh... No, that was no. later. Oh, okay, forgive me. No, that <laughs> was actually the they try to act like I know stuff. When he <laughs> when he left the band, they were Dalton James and Sutton. Okay, uh, and and he came back to Mineral Wells and uh, was just in the middle of getting out of music. He had right. enough of it, and uh, so our guitar player, mine and Frank's, mm -hmm. had gotten ill and couldn't play a, a date that we had you know, that we were going to play. And so, uh, we said, well, we're going to have to find somebody so we don't have to cancel this. Right. And so we went and talked to Gary and Gary's borrowed his dad's amp and came on out yeah. and the rest is history. It just took off oh, from yeah. there. We, we did that show and, uh, never looked uh, back, did a couple of practices and it was just the chemistry was there. And so that's basically how it formed was with what, us. What year are we talking here? Uh, We're talking early 70s. 71, wow. 72. Yeah. What was it like in Dallas, Fort Worth? What was the musical climate back then, or was there one? Mother Blues. Oh, yeah. Mother oh, Blues. Was, oh, yeah. yeah, Mother Blues, Gertie's. The Cellar. Uh, the, the Cellar. cellar My dad's going. told me stories Binary about that Star. place. <laughs> Binary Star was going. Yeah. Uh, Fort Worth, Mother Load. Uh, Licks. Gertie's. Licks, Gertie's. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. Yeah, it, we, it was busy back in them days. There was always and we played them all. Play. Yeah, uh, were you Spencer's did, Corner? Huh? Spencer's. Well, Spencer's like the song. Spencer's it, Corner. Yeah. <laughs> Fat, it was oh, Fat Albert's first. Yeah, yeah. that was what it was called. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Now, when you played these places, did you get to play your own music? As or did you? Was this like the strictly uh, the three? Uh, Set a night cover acts. It was Jerry Set a night. Okay. We always yeah. played. Our last set was always original. Your own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. How did that go over with the uh, patrons? Did they enjoy well, it? Well, they knew did. who we were because we've been playing around yeah. for so long that we, you know, as we were writing them and starting to play them, they got familiar with them, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, they just it got accepted well, right. and so we just kept doing it until we released the album, and then. And then 
you know, the rest is history. Everybody liked it. So. Yeah. It's a phenomenal album, and since you went there, I'll back back on that. Uh, this didn't come out till 79. How long were you playing these songs together until uh, you recorded it? Uh, we were probably, what, 74 RD? Yeah. 74, somewhere in there. Well, the album. We, yeah, we had... We started writing the stuff back when Frank, yeah. before Frank left the band. Right. Fox hunting in Hell Hotel. And Great they, songs, absolutely yeah. phenomenal they, songs. Yeah. Right, and then they, and then we finished them, and you know before we recorded, but we, right. but we were playing them a long time before we recorded them, right. and uh, of course that took an investor. And when that came along, then, yeah. then uh, we had the music at the time, so we went in and. What was that, Dallas Sonic, mm -hmm. where we recorded the album? Yep. We had to hurry up and get done doing the album because they were they were tearing the building down. Oh, no. <laughs> they were tearing the building down as soon as we got through, and they had a date to for us to get finished. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, releasing an album is pretty uh, simple in 2019. How did was this released in uh, 1979? Uh, you did it yourselves. Uh, how, how did that come about? Well, it's... It's always tough getting something in the market, and uh, so what happened with us, with us was we we got uh, we got airplay pretty much. Well, Q one hundred two took it, got a hold of it. Mm -hmm. Somebody gave them a copy of it, mm -hmm. and they played it at midnight one night. They played fox hunting, and then they started getting a whole bunch of of phone ins and requests. To, to play some more and they got their phones blew up so bad that they ended up playing the whole album between when the one disc jockey left and the next one came on nice yeah. so the disc jockey that was leaving put the album on and left it play and one coming in did, <laughs> didn't take it off and come on back home until it was finished and that took off like a firestorm the phone started blowing up and then I know I talked to I called in to request it one day myself, <laughs> and the disc jockey got mad at me because he said, no, I'm not going to play it. He said, I've heard, he said, I'm tired of all these calls coming in about Black Horse. He said, I'm getting Black Horse to death. He said, I'll play it when I get ready to play it. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> I told him, I'm just a fan, man. I want to I hear the song. And so, but they, it wasn't, but just a week or so after they played the whole album that it, it got on rotation. Oh, excellent. And then once it got on rotation, a week or so later, it went to heavy rotation. Yeah. And that was Fox Hunting and Hell Hotel. Right. Incredible. Both of them. And, and then Q102, uh, Kazu picked it up and put it on their rotation. Right. And then KLOL down in Houston picked it up. I think they're still going, by the way. KLOL. And they picked it up and they put it on heavy rotation. Hmm. And and then just one thing led to another. And so we were getting heavy airplay in some major areas. But back then, when you were independent to get to get your album actually put in a store, you had to have distribution. Correct. And so Where the labels come in. We, we hit Big State up, you know, and thought we were going to get a distribution contract with them since we were already getting this airplay. But as it were, that distribution contract fell out and because we were on an independent label and nobody favored independent labels back then and, you know, times have changed now. But so... Why didn't the big uh, the big ones come hollering once they saw all this regional they did, success? They did. We got we got a letter from Capital. Uh, actually, they came and seen us twice. Oh, okay, that was came my next question. Did any showcases go out? Go yeah, down, they came or? and seen us in Houston uh, at the Palladium. We were doing a mm -hmm. show with Bugs and uh, Bugs Henderson, mm -hmm. right? Okay, uh, and he was actually opening for us. Nice <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, we opened for him plenty, but our record was doing pretty good. He had one out at the same time. Anyway, they flew in to see us then, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, it just it didn't come to fruition. Any idea why? Because you guys were really popular. Well, and, and, I'm and, not just going by off what you said. Uh, 
everyone I've talked to to prepare for this conversation. Well, it, the, the, what, said how popular and, and, and we thought it was a shoe in because Gary, the guitar player, back when he was in L.A., he ran. He flew around. He flew all over everywhere. But he flew with one of the guys that was there from the A.R. department. Was actually one of the guys that flew with Gary back and forth between Hollywood and Las Vegas when they were doing shows at Las Vegas. <laughs> and so they knew each other by first name and hugged and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, this is going to be a shoe. And we sat backstage after the show and laughed and uh, talked about plans and this one thing and the other. And then whenever they got on the, uh, the plane and flew away, uh, our management would, wasn't able to, uh, they got hard to get a hold of, so... I mean, I really don't know, and that's how fickle the business is. Uh, we came so close so many times. That, uh, it was, yeah. you know, in every other way in life, we were there. Mm -hmm. We just wasn't. We just wasn't signing on the dotted line, right? Yeah. And and same thing happened. What with, it happened with Warner Brothers as well. So. What excuses did they give you? Did you ask them, or were you able to? Or they said. And I'm going to be real honest about this. Okay. They said we sounded like a unpolished uh, Molly Hatchet. <laughs> oh. I went because we played. We've yeah. been playing with Molly Hatchet here and there. Uh, I didn't see that correlation. But, I don't either. And but I they like did, both bands. They did, and so you know. Uh, but that's how that happened. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot more opportunity. I mean, we went to L.A. and seen them out, seen Capitol again out there in a different set of people. And uh, we did had just written a song called Walk on Water, and they bid on that one. This was after Fox Hunting and all of that. This was, wasn't on an album uh, on, the, on any of the Black Horse stuff that we recorded. But it was one of our new ones at the time, and they bid on it. And what they said was, Give us more stuff like this, and we'll come back to see you. And they left it at that. But so you remember that trip? Oh right? yeah, you were there. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, when did you guys decide to be a four piece? Uh, isn't that when you joined Donnie? Uh, actually, they were four piece. There, there was a couple other members. Of oh, the excuse me. So uh, finding information on you guys has not been easy. <laughs> <laughs> so forgive me if I was, I was the second. Okay, the second second guitarist. Second second guitarist. Well, yeah. Donnie had been Donnie had been coming around. In fact, he saw us at Tarrant County Convention Center yeah, with yeah. Triumph and Montrose. Right. And I never. Oh, I, I did, found that information I, on that. I didn't know this until he sent me a ticket. He texted me a ticket, and I said. You mean to tell me you were there? Yeah. He, said, he said, yeah, I just turned 17. Nice. <laughs> and that was just recently. <laughs> yeah. Down there. yeah. And so, but he, but he had been, he had been around for a while. And then he started coming around jamming with us. Mm -hmm. And we really liked the way he played guitar. Absolutely. And then we had trouble with uh, the guitar player we were, that, we had brought in to be the fourth piece because we wanted to go four piece at one point in time, just check it out. And, uh, and so when we had trouble with the guitar player we had then, uh, Donnie stepped right in and he had already been jamming with us and mm -hmm. been listening to us. He already knew the songs, uh, a few practices and boom, we were right back out playing with Donnie. And Very cool. it's, I mean, he took over the harmonies. He did, you know, everything, everything that we asked him to do, he did and excelled at it. So, and it's been that way ever since. That's why I said he feels like home. He does. He does indeed. <laughs> well, you guys seem to have a friendly chemistry together. Um, we'll be right back with more uh, with Black Horse. You're listening to Reckless Rock Radio on KNON 89.3 FM. We're back with uh, John, Frank, and Donnie from Black Horse. Again, gentlemen, thank you for Thank you for speaking with us. Um, let's go back to uh, now, Frank. Did you you left the band, mm -hmm. and that's when Gary came in? Is that correct, or were no. you all together at the no, same Gary, time? No, Gary, Gary, Frank, and myself. You all founded the band. We founded okay. the band. Right. We were actually called Zachariah 
right? <laughs> and and that was just because we had to have something to go play. Have a quick. name. Gotcha. And we hated that, so we played this club called Everybody's Talking. Mm -hmm. uh, E.T.'s short for Everybody's Talking, but it's called <laughs> E.T.'s. And uh, Lil Bar and the bartender, his name was Steve Blackhorse. He was a, Blackhorse. an Indian guy. Yep. He's, his name was Steve Blackhorse. Well, one of us went up, and, or a bunch of us went up and ordered drinks, and we found his, found out his name was Blackhorse. Right. And we changed our name right in the middle of the set. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. We, went back, we yeah. went back after that break, and we announced that we're Blackhorse. Very cool. <laughs> and, he, and this guy was a little bit, uh, he, he I was, don't want to say prejudiced, but. <laughs> For lack of a better word, he was prejudiced. He, he didn't like it. He didn't like the idea that we didn't. And, uh -huh. and to my knowledge, Steve, if you're out there, uh, I hope you come to accept us after 40 some odd years. <laughs> <laughs> Gary had ran into him about, oh my God, like three or four years ago. Was it? Yeah. He ran into him in a store, and Gary told me, he said, you know what, Frank? He is still pissed off at us. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, let's go back to uh, that gig in Tarrant County uh, Convention Center with uh, Ronnie Montrose, Gamma, and uh, Triumph. Was, was that, Triumph, was that yeah. the correct lineup? Yeah. Right. Yeah. How'd you guys get that gig? Was it just from being popular, so popular regionally? or? Well, that actually came from, from uh, Q102. They were actually uh, putting on that show. Okay. And... Uh, well, it was Q102, wasn't it, mm -hmm. RD? Yeah. yeah. 15,000 in attendance, and it was yeah, free, it was, right? it was full. Yeah. It, I mean, it was full. The fire marshal should have actually ran a few thousand out. Ooh. But it yeah. But, it, but so it actually came about because we had been playing the area so long, and this album was new. We get an airplay. Uh, so it's not like nobody knew, didn't no, know who you no. were. And so right. the... The disc jockey at the, and I'm trying to think of who that was. I can't Q102? remember. Q102? For yeah. Q102 at the time. Anyway, he he put us on the show, and then he gave us a letter that he wrote Columbia Records. Okay. On Q102 letterhead mm -hmm. that was that said it was to Peter Philbin with Columbia in the A&R department and saying... It was talking about a conversation they had had when they were flying somewhere together and about Peter was telling the DJ, if you find any bands that you think I ought to look at, well, let me know. And he reminded him of that conversation and said in the letter, well, I've, I've, I have found one and that I think is worth you coming to look at. Of course, he's in L.A. And so he said, I've put them on a free show that I'm doing with uh, Ronnie Montrose and Triumph at Tarrant County Convention Center, such and such date, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I really think you should should come to see these guys. And uh, I've still got the letters, matter of fact. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, that came about because of just, of us just beating the streets and pounding our guitars and going and, you know, kicking ass in these clubs and, and get, you know, the fans were everything, man. Right. I mean, the fans, when they opened the doors of that place, I was still up on stage doing a drum check and they opened all them doors at the end down there and looked like a bunch of cattle coming through. Nice. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden the place was full. And you, it was did time you get a chance to do a sound check? No, we didn't yeah. even get to do a sound oh, check. Oh, just had to go in there and throw yeah. it to the wolves. Yeah. Huh? I mean, Big yeah. Ronnie barely made it up to the, the follow <laughs> spot. <Yeah. laughs> now the next he was our engineer on that show too, by oh. the way. The next year uh, you did Zoo World at the Dallas Convention Center. Uh, who else played that show? Were you on first or? Bugs played the first show I did, we did, I think. Uh, didn't he? Or I, he? I think so, yeah. I think he did. In 1980? In 80. 80. I believe that was Bugs. 1981, uh, I don't remember because we headlined it. Yes, that right. was the year that we had the 17 foot Black Horse album backdrop. Oh, 17 by 14. Yeah. Uh, looked just like that hanging up behind us, and it was all uh, it that was, was before projection screen. <laughs> you, know, you had to get one of the, oh, the real paint, deal. It was, was daybow yeah. paint, so we had a 
huge line of black lights back yeah we had to put up a bunch of black lights to shine up on it because it was all for us but boy i mean once it lit up we had it covered with a black sheet whenever we started the black sheet came down the lights came on and it was fluorescent big gigantic horse up there it was really nice there's a couple of clips that you can see this on youtube yes, i've yeah. seen uh spencer's corner in that one of them and mm -hmm. i forgot what the other one is forgive me i don't have it in front of me <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's on the the zoo tapes are actually on online. Yeah, uh, on YouTube, yeah, on YouTube. It's three yeah. YouTube, just look up KZW uh, zoo, zoo tapes, World, zoo, zoo world, world, zoo world. It'll yeah. show pop yeah. right up. Zoo World, nineteen eighty. Yeah. yeah, you guys realize you have fans all over the world. Do you, we how, do you do know that, right? Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, because every time we. Uh, Every time we turn around, there's somebody overseas telling us that they bought our album somewhere. Uh, that's right. what I was going to say. It's being bootlegged Kerrang overseas. Magazine in the United Kingdom has you guys' uh, record as in one of their articles as one of the best records you cannot find. Yeah. <laughs> I get We get that's that right. a lot from, right. from Belgium and, and, I mean, all kinds of places. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the last minute, I'd get nothing done. I, my copy of your album, finally, I've had several burn copies over the last few years, but I've right. never had an official one, okay, because I was broke, but I had to have it for today. So hey, We've all been here. <laughs> <laughs> Call me, I would have gave you one. I appreciate it. It's all good. Money well worth spent, because it's a phenomenal record. Uh, any right. way you're going to, uh, any possible way you're going to re-release it? Uh, on CD again or on another uh, redistribution well, of the vinyl? We've actually talked about um, putting together another one and re-releasing this one with it. Okay. Uh, to kind of help each other out. but yeah. New songs as well or just like old um, stuff you had laying well, around over the years? A mixture because there's a lot of songs that didn't get recorded or that got recorded mm -hmm. that didn't make the album. Right. Uh, and so there's a lot of material laying around. And then all of, these, all, of the, <laughs> all of these guys and us as a band right now mm -hmm. have a load of material laying around too so right. you know material is not the problem it's it's actually getting into the studio because mm -hmm. we're broke <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but we I think we know people who help out but <laughs> wink, we, wink. we are definitely uh do plan on doing some recording. Excellent. Uh, so this is uh, not just going to be another one-off show coming up next Friday. No, this uh, is not a reunion show. This is, no. uh, I mean, it is a reunion of all of us brothers that we've known each other for 30-plus years, and, right. and mine and Frank's and Ronnie's case uh, since high school. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's we honestly want to go out and promote ourselves and do, and do some recording, and, you know... Um, so another hey, chapter of the band is yeah. it really is, and if we if our take on it is if nothing if nothing comes out of it, then by God we're going to have some fun going out. Excellent, you know exactly. what I'm saying? It's, well, it's made full circle. You know, it's heck yeah. Oh, excuse me. All right, a uh, couple of listener questions. Uh, who is going to be singing Gary's part since he's not here anymore? Rest in peace, by the way. Uh, well, uh, right there, right? yeah, who's going to be? We're going to be splitting it up. We, okay. we have split it up pretty much. Uh, Donnie sings Mama Gonna Love You Tonight, and Frank sings Lucille. I sing Hell Hotel. Uh, sure. We got it covered. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know that I know that Gary. Would he want it that way. He'd be cool with this, so yeah. yeah but I yes. mean, you don't. I, if it were me, I wouldn't want my my material laying dormant when somebody could be spreading it out, you know. Right. And, and because he worked all his life to to do this stuff, so why let it lay? You know, that's the way we look at it. Uh, next question from the listener was the Hell Hotel. Uh, what inspired that song? Uh, from looking at the lyrics, it sounds like it was quite the uh, eventful evening. Well, uh, I think Hell Hotel is, is one of those that's a, really a good one to be up to interpretation. But if you want the real skinny on it. Please. It was, <laughs> Hell Hotel, Gary used to live in a, in a townhouse 
a small one. It had a garage, and at the end of the garage, it had a little tool room, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, you get out of your car, go over here, yeah. and there's a little tool room. Well, that used to be, this was after he moved back from Los Angeles when he mm -hmm. was playing out there all this time, and he would go into that tool room. He had a wife and, and a new baby, and family life, you know, he was working a eight to five, and, and <clears throat> so he used to use this tool room to go and get away. And so basically he went in there and did some writing and he wrote Hell Hotel in that tool room and that became mm -hmm. Hell Hotel was actually that tool room. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Not a, at all what I was picturing, no, but that's no, okay. <laughs> that became Hell Hotel because he, he was, that's where he, I'm trying to be cool here. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's why I have said. We already think you're cool. It's all I could, good. I could wreck some people's life here. And so he was just trying to be cool per his family situation when Understood. he had to get, yeah. when he had to go out in the tool room. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> and therapy. And, yeah, therapy. Yeah, therapy. And so yeah. it, basically he wrote Hell Hotel about that room and, and his situation. Mm hmm. Now, playing the, all those Q102 and KZW events, uh, did you ever go on, get on any tours, or did anybody pick you up? Did you open for anybody reputable in town, uh, like on their, when they were dropping in to play, oh, say, yeah. McFarland's Auditorium, or I'm just trying to name places my dad used to tell me he would go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dallas Convention Center. All we that played stuff. Winter Garden with... Uh, Alice Cooper, we played, oh, Winter, wow. we played the Winter Garden with uh, 10 yeah. years after. Yeah. Alvin Lee. Alvin, Alvin Lee. Lee. Incredible. Yeah. He tried to pick my old lady up, man. <laughs> <laughs> I said, dude, I love you, but you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but Humble we Pie. Played, oh, we nice. Played, uh, yeah. yeah, with Humble Pie over at uh, the Agora. Palladium. Palladium? Palladium. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Palladium and the Agora, Agora are the same, same building, but yeah. they changed names at yeah, some right. point in time. I just always call it the Palladium. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, played with Humble Pie there. Uh, we were standing on the edge of the stage, and Steve Marriott was like, Oh, nice. He, yeah. he was singing right here. We were off over here behind the curtain, and this guy can hock a loogie further than anybody else. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> disgusting, but awesome. I mean, we were, we, were 30, we were 30 foot off the side of the stage, and he was hitting right at the edge of our feet. We kept having to back up, and he had us backed all the way against the wall over there. And he he was hocking them right in between songs, or right in between the verses. Like, like one of those guy. spitting lizards or something. Oh, <laughs> damn. I remember he came in the, the, the green room, and... and he was screwing around, and Gary opened up his briefcase, and he had like a 12-pack in there or something. And he, oh, he remember he flipped out. Yeah. He went to grab and some of them. He grabbed a little bit of everything in that he, dressing he room. He did, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, he liked our dressing room so much, he hung out in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then he liked us after the, after he hung out in the dressing room yep. so much that he went out and dedicated. He started with, I don't need no doctor and dedicated it to us. <laughs> we told him we played that song. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and he, he said, this is too, man, yeah, I can't talk like English like he did, but he, mm. he dedicated it to the band. Man, it was really cool. So <laughs> that's when we went down, stood on the side of the stage, and he was hawking loogies at us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back with more with Black Horse. You're listening to Reckless Rock Radio on KNON 89.3 FM. Now, uh, before the break, we uh, mentioned some bands you guys used to play with, Humble Pie, 10 years after, and then the name Van Halen was thrown around. Would you like to touch on that? Uh, you almost had the Women and Children to uh, first tour? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it was in 1980, and uh, the I was telling him on break... Blue. That, <laughs> I was telling him on break Blue. that uh, we, we got a... We got a notice from, uh, or a phone call from Paragon Agency in New York, and uh, they had put us on the tour with uh, Van Halen, 13 city tour, and it started up in uh, Washington State on the with the what turned out to be the infamous Eminem show. Oh, the Brown Eminem yeah, show, where yeah. they wrecked everything in life got barred from the town. Anyway, we would have been there. Uh, and I say, <laughs> I say would have been there. 
uh, we were booked on the show uh, until David Lee Roth. This went. This rocked on for. We were actually booked on the show for about. Man, we rocked on for about six weeks before we actually knew. Mm-hmm. But we already our our equipment was going to be put on the back of their truck so that we could take just one truck. And, right. You know, and uh, and then of course our equipment was going to come off first anyway, so we played first. We had it all planned out and all down, right down to wardrobe. Uh, you know, we had the 13 city tour dates written down on a calendar. T-shirts. Yeah, T-shirts, the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. And so basically, a long story short, some weeks later, David Lee Roth and the band, they reviewed the album, our album. And yeah. David Lee Roth did, didn't want another high intensity three piece band on the show. Yeah. And and I'll tell you in a minute how I know this for a fact. Okay. Uh but he didn't want another and so it was pretty much down to Dear David because the as it turns out the other guys in the band didn't they didn't have a they didn't have they a didn't pressure. care. So what they ended up doing what they wanted somebody that they could actually upstage. Like they needed to upstage anybody anyway. Right. So they ended up putting the Penguins on the tour. I was going to say, they always had the most bizarre opening acts. Well, that's why. It was David Lee Roth. Yeah. And the reason I know this for a fact is because Paul Middleton, bass player on the album, he, when he left the band, he went out on the road with Bonnie Raitt for 30 plus years. Oh, okay. So that was my answer to one question I had. Whatever okay. happened to him? Well, yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got he, another job. He was Bonnie with Julio Ray. Iglesias for a while, too. But right. he but he was out mainly with Bonnie for all those years. And so, he, you know, Bonnie has a lot of fans. And, sure. And Van Halen was really like Bonnie a lot. And so at one of the shows that they were doing, uh, Eddie Van Halen and... Michael, Michael, yeah, Michael Anthony, the bass player, came to see Bonnie. Well, they came backstage and they were all back there. And Paul got them aside and said, "Say, do you remember remember a band back in 1980 called Black Horse?" <laughs> and they remembered. Yeah. And he he asked him about it. He said, "Why was it that they ended up not on the tour?" And uh, they knew all about it. And they 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 told the same story I just told you that David Lee Roth. Uh, reviewed it and decided that we that they didn't need to be oh. another high intensity three piece band. Didn't like that show. higher energy. Yeah, I mean it's not like anybody was going to upstage them, it, including us, because they had hit records. I mean, and then a monster guitar player and and their mm-hmm. whole act was killer. But uh, but I, I thought he was being a little paranoid by by doing mm-hmm. that. Because I thought it would have been a really good show. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I agree, really large show. Yeah, but it—that's why it didn't come to fruition. But it was a close call, and we were on cloud nine. Now, there's no doubt in our mind, but what if we would have done that show, we'd have been on Warner Brothers right after. That. Oh, damn it, Dave! Yeah, yeah. That's what we <laughs> I thought. don't know that I can defend him any longer. Like I've been doing all my life. <laughs> that was my first band that's that I got into was Van Halen. It's one of the things right from right from Paul's mouth is. He actually hit them up with that. You know, y'all need to understand. A lot of people don't understand nowadays. It's just the smallest decision like that can just have a such a Trimpling profound effect on, yes. on, on, on bands, on the families, members of bands, the whole yeah, it's the whole life of band members. So, yeah. You know, yeah, take these decisions. It yeah. sent things in a different direction. But I mean, we you know we were still we were still knocking at it and the album was still being played and we still you know so we didn't get our dauber in the dirt we just turned our tail and ran the other way and and mm-hmm. kept on going but but it is it is a testament to where we could have been yeah what if man yeah i'm not going to listen to <laughs> skyscraper eat them and smile and <laughs> women and children first the same anymore hey, but that's all right that's all right Quite frankly, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> quite frankly, I still like I like them and always have. Yeah. Now, uh, when you guys were playing locally, uh, was there any uh, camaraderie with the other bands? Did you get along with them? Uh, yeah, tight friends. Yeah, was we it all friends with family? Rocky, Rocky Athos, right? Uh, Lightning, all those guys right. we, we talked about earlier. 
Um, all the point blank. Bunch. Point blank were real tight friends of ours. Yeah, we were. Yeah. We were. Love them. They're we were, Yeah, we were good buds with Point Blank since conception. Oh, in fact, man. we were playing when they got together. Uh, we, me, Frank, and Gary were playing Fat Alberts, which right. was later Spencer's Corner, right over by TCU, and and Point Blank came in. With the same guy that was trying to manage us was trying to manage them at the time. This was before they got with Bill Ham. Right. But they were just getting together, and they came in, and we had a full house. Well, you know, our manager guy was was bringing them in to sit in with us and get them some exposure. Right. Before a club that they could possibly play at. Well, he brought them in, and they went up and sat in on our stuff. We'd never seen them before. <laughs> And I'm telling you, they burned the house down. Oh, man. Yeah. They Tremendous. did. Tremendous. They, yeah, they started with some Almond Brothers. There ain't no way out. And I mean, nice. uh, John O'Daniels just melted people's faces. Yeah. And then the two guitar players, you know, Kim and, and Rusty, did their harmony guitar parts and stuff. And I mean, it was, yeah. me and Frank looked yeah. at each other and went, hey, do you want to go back to work? <laughs> <laughs> But we had to go up and play. But yeah, we, I started blank was was friends of ours forever, and yes. we toured with them a bunch. We yeah, played. you guys went on actual tours. Yeah, we, yeah. well, we uh, when they came in, they were out on the road with Journey for a year or so, I guess, or better part of a year. Right. When they came in, when they came in for from Journey in between some of Journey stints, they did. Uh, two and three thousand seat halls that they headlined when they did well, like Kane's Ballroom in in uh, Tulsa, Tulsa, and and then they would they would ask us if we wanted to play. And of course, they knew we were gonna we were gonna fill the ticket and bring some people, and and so we yeah we played a lot with them a lot. And, even rode on their tour bus some. Nice. <laughs> that was fun. Because <laughs> they was cooking up shrimp scampi along the way. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you guys keep it together uh, during the first tenure before you decided to hang it up for a while? And why did you, considering how popular you were? Gosh. They had changed to, it, it changed it to the cause. Right. In the, in the we never really hung it up. Yeah. Uh, we we just morphed into a different kind of a band. Uh, what was the cause like? I well, had first that. we went when we went four piece. We had Donnie. Okay, and he and Donnie was part of the nucleus of, of the cause, and uh, myself and Gary James. Basically, what it was was we took four guys we had, added a keyboard player, went and wrote an album, called it the Cause. And it was a, it was a, for lack of a better word, it was, it was a journey kind of band. Cause we were, mm. so it was, were five instead bands. of Southern rock, Southern 80s, hard rock, it was yeah, kind of morphed into AOR. Yeah. Okay. It was a, it like, kind of like Point Blank's uh, stuff after uh, their third, fourth album. Yeah. Oh, I stayed together for several years. Uh, Middle age. We were getting ready to go on tour and the keyboard player quit. And the tour was already booked, and we had to cancel it, and it burned a bunch of bridges. So it wasn't it wasn't but a couple of years that that actually stayed together. But hell of a band during that during that process, though we we our investors uh, her name is Laura Church, and uh, she was also part of the the record the independent record company. And uh, she did a lot of our business for us in our record company store. And Van Halen came back into play again. <laughs> this Mark time, Thickens. This, <laughs> this, this time, Ed Leffler, their manager, who's rest his soul, mm. has, I just found out, has died here sometime in the last few years. I don't know. But anyways, Ed Leffler got a hold of our album. And was looking to, he was looking to manage us. And they really? They were still with Warner Brothers. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, he and Laura talked for, uh, I don't know, a couple of months. Well, what became of that? Well, uh, you know, Hager was with them then. 
Right. This is in the <laughs> mid eight, mid to, oh, mid to late eighties. <laughs> yeah. Sammy. It's an inside joke we have at the studio. Yeah. Half uh, I'm outnumbered. I'm broth and Lou and Lear. Oh, Sam. I see. I see. So <laughs> me, and my, me and my son are like that. So. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we we uh, it rocked on, and he got he got busy and wrote us. He wrote us a letter. He and he he was real cordial about it. He said, "Look, you know." Van Halen was fixing to release another album, and and it it rocked along. Our business with him rocked along until that came up on him, mm -hmm. and he had to bow out because he was getting busy with their release. So, oh. had it been a little bit, the timing on it was kind of weird. Had it been a little bit earlier, maybe we would have been with him during that release or during their their tour. Uh, and maybe we could have went on tour with them, maybe you know. But I mean, there again, uh, timing and yeah. damn. So, but we crossed paths with them a couple of times. I, I've always thought that was kind of strange, yeah. Because it's almost like it should have happened, but it didn't. Yeah, you're on the radar, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you were. Yeah. We'll be right back with more with Black Horse. You're listening to Reckless Rock Radio on KNON 89.3 FM. All right, now you guys have done some one-offs here and there the last decade or so. Is this one, this incarnation of the band, this is going to stick? So this isn't just a one-night-only thing. There's, it goes up from here, right? Right. Yeah. Well, right. We're, we're, we're pretty much, you know, our mantra, so to speak, is... is you know, we're we're in it for us. We're gonna have a good time. Great. Uh, we're not gonna carry any monkeys on our backs. You know, of of expectations of other, you know, record companies or 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 other people that are looking at us for any particular reason. We, if it pleases us, then that's that's what we care about. Awesome. That's right. what we're doing it for. Yeah. Right. We have, we have fun doing it. You know. That's right. And anything that comes along with that. Uh, and we expect there probably will be some things, but uh, we're not going to go try to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. We're just going to play and have a good time and see what comes of it. So right. what can fans expect musically this time around? Uh, going to go back to the more southern hard rock? or uh, I, I say pretty much I, I say pretty much an extension of what we are. Right. Which Excellent. Is, uh, we're not... We we like that vein. Am yeah. I speaking? Am I all right? Y'all all right with it? I mean, I mean yeah. Black Horse has got a. Our music's got a set of teeth in it that won't quit. I mean, when we play, it's it's. We we're, we're ramming it. We're we're biting your ass. You it, know, basically, it's fifty pounds. I mean, we add fifty pounds to the song. <laughs> <laughs> So along with a possible reissue of the 1979 self-titled album, there might be more albums or uh, new, new songs on the re on the reissue. Or has that been discussed? Or it, it's the format is kind of up in the air as far mm -hmm. as that goes. But as uh, yeah, we'll definitely have some new material. Excellent. Yeah. But it'll be in the black in that black horse tradition. Yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. And you guys have all got stuff been laying around for, mm -hmm. with Absolutely. other bands that we we have we have stuff that's been was pre written, you know, back right. back by the by the album guys. Uh we have loads of stuff that's that we're working on right now that everybody right. has in mind and on sheet. Um, yeah. so we yeah, there's not a lack of material. The biggest thing is right now we've been concentrating on on pulling our show together. Okay. Uh, and fair enough. And you know, getting that out of the way and getting out doing it. Uh, once we do this Diamond Gems thing and get it behind us, then we we will uh, start doing some other things. So this is a testing the waters kind of gig. Yeah, well, I, I guess you. I guess you could call it that. Uh, it's Friday a stage. night. People come out. It's a stage, <laughs> and it's got a, a beer fountain, and so we're gonna play it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I seen a band one time count to four and bust out in a fist fight, so you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, I'm bringing my baseball back. <laughs> well, on behalf of the fans, gentlemen, thank you for reuniting and continuing on. This music really still needs to be heard. The style of music 
does not need to go away, uh, especially here in the south of all places. But uh, uh, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you on Friday, okay? We thank, thank you, brother. Thank you, man.